Okay. So we have some questions sent in. Is there a funded brand of folic acid for pregnant celiac patients? Matt, does anybody, anybody in our advisory panel know the answer to that? I believe there is a funded brand, but the concern is that um, the dose of folic acid in it is not high enough. So when my daughter is pregnant and is under the care of um, an endocrinologist at Fertility Associates, the um, recommended dose was much, much higher than we could get in any of our funded products in New Zealand, which was sort of a concern at the time. Okay. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that. Um, celiac disease group asks lots of questions about how it takes for blood to correct after going gluten free, especially for children, and also the frequency of post diagnostic tests. So, yeah, how long does it take for the blood tests to start coming back? Is that the $61 million question? <laughs> So routinely I check serology after six months of being on a gluten-free diet and the majority of children, 75-80% would be normal at that point point. Okay. and the remainder um, would usually improve, would normalise over the following six months. Um, <clears throat> and um, in general, most studies suggest by 12 months, 90 plus, 95 percent plus of children have complete normalization of their histology. Um, could get to a much lower number in adults, but um, obviously that's if one's continuing a strict gluten-free diet and not having exposure, etc., etc. Okay, cool. Thank you. <coughs> so the frequency of the post-diagnostic tests is there some kind of what it looks like? Just to carry on from that, uh, um, sometimes in my experience here yeah, with the um, post-diagnosis serious psychology, I've seen patients up to two years that might have um, a positive serious psychology, but they, are, you know, they have come down with pressure really. yeah. I think there's one study, maybe can count it, where up to 10 or 15 percent in two years out. Might still be positive. So I, I, I would really like Andrew to say, you know, most of them got better by um, 12 months, but I, I do see some that so, so this is what they continue to drop without any experience is good. I believe sometimes the higher the CDF and the other set, the longer it may sometimes take to normalize. And one of the things that we certainly came across when we did a good bit of research into the diagnosis is that the labs will only quantify to up to 250. But actually, if you quantify further, some of those kids have got you know, antibodies in well into the thousands. So you repeat the antibodies at six months, there's greater than 250 at the start. It may still be greater than 250, but you don't know whether it's coming from 5,000 to 251. Um, right. So um, I think if there's clinical improvement, if the blood tests haven't normalized at six months, as I said, you may repeat at six months later. Okay. Too overly stressed about results not completing normalizing. Okay. So the, the frequency of tests would be a six month after you start a gluten free diet and then possibly 12 months. So it must be six to 12 months. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Are there any plans to test for adverse reaction to avenin? Is that how you say that? Avenin. Mm -hmm. Avenin? Okay. That's the protein. It's the protein. Yeah. 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 Oh. <laughs> Um, this, I don't, I'm not aware of any specific plans to test for that, um, or any specific platform that we have available to do that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no. Wouldn't it be the expense and the accessibility of um, scope seeking mm -hmm. that would make it really, really difficult? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So the answer to that really is there's no um, there's no testing available at this point, and no plans that you're aware of. Yeah. Okay. And I think it would be worthwhile to mention what New Zealand's position is on consumption of oats because there is a lot of clearance. So 
on, on the map, if you like. So, uh, the, the issue with hope, not only is the whole animal in question, but all our New Zealand based hopes are wet contaminated anyway. Um, the farms are too small, the, the shared silos, shared processing, the risk is just far too high with any of our New Zealand produced oats. So the oats that they come up with, gluten free, are typically um, Canadian based oats where you'll get um, a huge farm only dealing with oats. So there are very little risk of cross contamination. But um, Celiac New Zealand position is still no oats. Okay, cool. This other question that I mentioned is the oats challenge. Um, is that performed in New Zealand? So biopsies before and after just consuming oats or not being I often discuss it with patients, but I'm not aware of anyone that's gone through the process. Once again, I think it's probably the expense and the accessibility of the required follow-up yeah. to actually manage that. So they just need to discuss that with their health provider if they want to try to leave. Is anyone else aware of anybody who's Okay, the question here around blood tests, is there any way to tell whether your blood is up from a single large gluten event compared to several small gluten events? Question. <laughs> any comments from, from the panel? <laughs> I, 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 I wanted to fork it with the um, with our trends and just um, one off um, exposure to treatment would be much changed in the sense of to be more cumulative and um, over time that you might get mild elevations and more transmittalized antibodies. That's my feel. So you're more likely to see it with a build up rather than a, a one off event? Yes. Andrew? And just to add, so some of the work that Bob Anderson's doing and colleagues <coughs> looking at IL2 responses, so a cytokine that changes very quickly after exposure and goes up really quick, quickly and correlates with symptoms of nausea, particularly, and other symptoms after acute exposure. Okay. Um, and so there's very clearly lots of events that happen. Um, at the moment, measuring IL2 isn't available as a routine test. It may well be, and over the passage of time, that that becomes a new way to diagnose or to assess for celiac disease. Um, but at the moment, it's really promising, but clearly tells us that there's lots of events that happen at that very acute short term as well. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so, just following along with that, how often should somebody with celiac disease go and have their blood tests done to make sure everything's on track? What do you recommend? The international guidelines that have been published around the world vary a lot, but the general trend has, has been for annual blood tests, but <clears throat> is that too much, is that too little, and it probably depends a lot on the circumstances as well. But having a regular checkup in terms of an annual checkup like one does for one's blood pressure or whatever, yeah. um, is probably reasonable and appropriate and checking the blood tests from time to time. Okay. There is a European guideline that's coming out for children. Um, I haven't seen the advance of that, but I gather it's been worked on and sometime in the coming months will be released in that. But again, you know, there's no good evidence to support one or the other, it's expert opinion and okay. that sort of but having a consistent approach will be really important. Thank you. And also around testing, um, we have someone who went to the GP for blood tests, which showed high antibodies, but instead of a biopsy, the GP insisted on a gene test. Is that sufficient? Probably, probably no, but we need to get a bit more context around the question. Um, certainly there's, there's a lot of interest in biopsy for diagnosis for children, and as you all know, probably yeah. the European and Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology mm. have published quite clear guidance as to which children can qualify for a biopsy for diagnosis. That's not yet been, uh, not been accepted in adult practice, and I don't know if this presumably the corner is an adult. Yeah. So I would expect that the practitioners still need to biopsy <coughs> then. 
um, with regards to the gene testing in children, even in biopsy pre-diagnosis, if they've got serological markers that are high enough, we, did, we now no longer need to do the gene test. Uh, in general terms, the gene test can be useful in certain specific circumstances, but in the case of this caller, he's got positive CDX serology, I think he needs a biopsy to to confirm it, yeah. Even just for peace of mind, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, osteoporosis is our next question. Bone density scans. Um, is, is somebody more prepositioned to osteoporosis with C back disease? And if so, should they bone density scans be performed? Certainly in active C -A disease, there's often malabsorption of calcium and vitamin D, both of which are important in terms of bones and bone health. Uh, most of the pediatric studies suggest that while there's decreased bone health, that, that improves within four to eight months after starting their gluten-free diet. Um, however, in an adult that's had C -A disease for years, and there may be significant impact upon bone health and bone densitometry may be important. I'm not sure that current guidelines everywhere say that to do that for everybody, <clears throat> but in someone who has a fracture history or significant malnutrition or really low vitamin D, that's going to be even more important to consider. So I don't do it routinely in children okay. unless there was another factor that I can't remember the last time I've done it before that. Um, you guys probably don't do it either for children. No. Unless it's a high fracture risk. So it's probably more relevant as you get older. And more relevant to adults. In the adults yeah, that I see, I always look at what their calcium consumption has been over their teens and twenties. Have they been regular consumers of, of high calcium products? And um, are they smoker? Have they had D weight bearing exercise? All of those things that contribute to bone health and make an assessment at that stage. Um, but with the adult women I see, we would definitely try and get them in uh, premenopausally and um, really actively try and up the calcium. But it's good to have a baseline, particularly in the adult population, if they've got an adverse history. Okay. And as Andrew uh, uh, has mentioned, the, the greatest risk is, is long term untreated CDM disease with a kind of long-term entropathy causing malabsorption. So it's certainly recognised that older adults can present with osteoporosis as a presenting feature of celiac disease, but if you've been diagnosed young and you've had good adherence to a gluten-free diet, uh, as Anna says, it's fine when you're getting appropriate kind of calcium and vitamin D, which should be that Thank you. Just got a couple more. Um, what about children here? So if your siblings, uh, should the siblings be tested for celiac disease as they get older or just once when the first child was diagnosed or what's it kind of? There's no international, well there's no sort of consensus overall. My, my practice is given the increased risk of first degree family members of about 10%, I do recommend screening the whole of the immediate family. Um, if the child is younger, let's say three, I might tend to suggest that they're screened again when they're seven and when they're 12, but <clears throat> um, uh, but there's not, and part of that comes from the Scandinavian data in terms of the pattern of serology over time, but there's no solid evidence to say that's the right times, but uh, I tend to do that. Um, yeah, I do similar. I mean, I guess this is one circumstance where occasionally gene testing is helpful. Um, clearly, I'll often see things share the same genes, but there is a chance that uh, one sibling could have the DQ2, DQ8 um, gene test, and the others may not have inherited those. So I tend to do CMX serology and, and potential gene testing. The answer that the gene test is negative, you don't have to worry about it. And again, if the gene test is positive, then again, I repeat sort of three to five years later, or, or if they become symptomatic in the interim. Yes, thank you. <coughs> And we'll also just do one last one. Is there anything that a newly diagnosed celiac can do to speed up the recovery? I think I'm those questions, I know. It's, uh, <laughs> tips and tricks to help? Well, it's just a time thing. Close it here in time. Time, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for that, guys. Appreciate that. Um, we're just going to have a 
video now that Rose is going to play for us. And then we'll have off the rest of our questions. <laughs> Why it's important for me to make sure a sea leg can come into a restaurant and feel safe, I want them to enjoy what everybody else enjoys and have the ability of not having fear that they're going to get sick. My name is Brent Martin, I'm the Executive Chef at the Park Hyatt Auckland. I think it's one of the biggest challenges for us as chefs is education with our own staff. Globally, there's a number of chefs that still don't understand what celiac disease is, and it's all about education. Having my mother affected with celiac has definitely changed my perspective as a chef. I've become more, more super aware, aware of your sanitization, your cleaning procedures, making sure you're not using products that have been contaminated with flour. Some products might have 0.1% gluten, and you don't realize unless you check. Cost contamination is a big thing, you know. Just the awareness of what's going on in the kitchen, separate chopping boards, using a gluten-free toaster for, for toast, separate kitchens to store gluten-free products. So it's really important that you're mindful of what's going on in your surrounding and what's going into these dishes regarding the, the ingredients of these dishes. Some kitchens, it's a bit of an afterthought, oh, I've got a gluten-free tonight, let's, let's make something up. But I think for us, it's sort of more of a let's have it available the whole time. I'm sure there's a number of restaurants don't have the time or the manpower to, to really care what's going on the plate. We want to be known for uh, the awareness of what's going into our food. It was important that we created this culture from day one. That's really where we stem from um, and then sort of that extended out for the afternoon tea. In, in our celebration of Celiac Week, We've created a gluten-free afternoon tea that everybody can enjoy. The whole experience is for everybody and you feel very inclusive in, in the menu. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Right. Oh, hi. Yeah, so that video presentation was prepared by Sarah Elborn, um, who has also produced the video Don't Pass the Bread, which is on our YouTube channel, and she'll be talking at our conference in November as well. So delighted to have Brent Martin here, Executive Chef of Ponimata, um, Living Room Captain Bar and the Pantry Eateries, 24 years cooking at Hyatt Hotels all over the world. Um, and excited to showcase this inventive style of cuisine to New Zealand. Brent's had the opportunity to cook for some very influential people, including royalty, major international sports teams, politicians, and the Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. um, and a career high officer and achieved the James Beard Award nomination for Best Chef of the Southeastern Caribbean in 1998. Um, He's also worked alongside New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, becoming an ambassador in the US for the Antipodes Water, Aura King Salmon and Carpet and Cheese. Brent was personally touched by celiac disease when his father was diagnosed later in life with the condition. He is passionate about using his rich knowledge of gastronomy to showcase celiac safe gluten-free cuisine across all three eateries within Park Hyatt and to demonstrate to the hospitality industry the need to be flexible and adapting the menu to suit the dietary requests and health requirements of all the customers. So we're really delighted to have this busy man mm -hmm. give him um, give us his time and um, expertise today. And we have got some questions to ask Brent after this presentation. Thank you. Well, kia ora, Thanks. Um, yeah, no, it's this has been an amazing journey for me as a career to cook around the globe and um, to come home to this beautiful property. Um, it's an honour for myself to really um, showcase what a five-star hotel is in New Zealand. And, um, yeah, we, we had this main canvas um, once we got here, um, and we really wanted to look at what we do in all our operations, and in every operation had its own concept, uh, own style of um, cuisine, own style of service. Um, so we had to think differently and personality-wise of each outlet. And when, when we went through this process, um, you know, it was important for us to obviously have everyone inclusive of what I said in my, my videos. And so 
So when we really looked at the menus, obviously everyone loves gluten, right? The bread, the pasta, mm -hmm. you name it, we, we, we sort of mm -hmm. need to have it. However, you know, the, the practices that we need to install in this hotel um, safely um, for, for everybody, uh, it was important. And it wasn't just going to be, it was um, nut allergies, you know, we, we were very mindful of um, even my main restaurant doesn't have any nuts. And so it was, it was important that we, we, we thought about everything um, in this whole allergen world. And we, we had a number of months, to be honest, to, to really hone in the, 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 the education. And so we really dove, dove down different allergens. Uh, we really worked with the team and, and really understanding what is gluten free. And uh, it's amazing what we found out. We, we had the opportunity and time to actually do a lot of research on a lot of products. And so the more research that we did, you know, as a chef, you think you sort of know everything, but you don't really. And it's just simple things that you would never think of ingredients that have gluten, baked beans, right? Who would ever think baked beans? Mm -hmm. um, cheeses, you know, some processed cheeses have different complex starches that go into these cheeses to, to make them what they are. Um, Non-fat uh, mayonnaise. You know, that they, they, some of them have malt in it. Like you, you don't know that some of these mayonnaises um, or dressings have these different starches. So these different yeah, starches per se throughout this um, process. So you know we 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 are, we are lucky that we we do have staff that we can make a lot of things in house. So we don't buy a lot of things that are processed um, or done outside the building. Yeah, we we do have to obviously include some particles throughout the whole hotel. Um, but it, as I said in my video, gluten-free toasters, you know, I have two gluten-free dedicated toasters throughout the, throughout the hotel. Um, you know, one's in our event space, one's in my restaurant space. But every day that they're wrapped up, that they're, they're, they're not you utilized for anything else. And we, we plastic wrap them every day. Um, it's all labeled gluten-free. Um, so it's really important that we really focus on this. Um, but for me, you know, my, my father was diagnosed later on in life, and it's interesting, you know, just, just quickly hearing you about the, the different bone structures and so forth and how it really affects. And you know, when I think about my dad, my dad has passed away since, but um, my dad was in his probably mid 50s, um, in, in, in the early 90s. So in the early 90s, this wasn't known. It was, mm -hmm. you know, there's a supermarket, so some of us remember Woolworths, right? So my dad would go down to Woolworths on a Tuesday, every Tuesday. And they would make him his bread. And this thing was like a rock. You could like knock somebody out with this piece of bread, right? But you know, they were making it in the same bakery as they were making all the other breads. And my dad thought it was the best thing ever. He felt so special. They welcomed him every day. Um, for him, it was his highlight. It was highlight, even though it wasn't the best bread, but this was highlight every, every, every week. So um, I was just on the verge of, of training us to become a chef, and we had no clue back then what it was. And, um, you know, when I look back at it to what we know today, um, and if we knew this, you know, 20 plus years ago, um, how different my dad's life would have been. And, um, you know, I did travel the globe, and my, my father did um, get to come enjoy some of my food, and, um, but I had to be mindful. I had to be mindful of that. And that really sort of taught me along the way that there is um, the best practice, and the um, better practice and the unknown. And what that really means is when I talk about globally, we, we're just not educated enough. And I, I worked in the Bahamas um, before I came here. Population of roughly about 200,000 lived on this island. But I can guarantee you probably 90% of that island didn't know what gluten free was. And so they're, they're a very obese uh, nation, um, they were a very sick nation. Um, but you know, I had to employ 400 plus cooks, and they've never been exposed to this. They've never been understood of you know what what goes in certain dishes, and they, they, the, the the cooking methods, the deep fryer that was used for the same fish and chips, but we're cooking potatoes in here. So there's a lot of different things that we had to come all the way back, and you know, it concerns me. You know, what what are we teaching our, our students? And I'm on a panel right now. Um, to talk about you know the, the, the teaching of apprenticeships, kind of apprenticeships, and you know, it's still very old school. It's talking about trusting a chicken and um, the mother sources, 
Yeah, that's all well and good, but we never use them anymore, right? This is this is something that's outdated. So we're really trying to um, have a big section of allergens in, in uh, this this program for our apprentices in New Zealand. So I really hope this goes a, a lot further than it is. This gets into their criteria um, because it, it is important. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the gluten free, it's everything that we put in our food and knowing what traces of food um, are out there. So um, to me, this is a, a big part of my heart, right? As I said, my, my dad would be, um, would be over the moon of what, what offerings he can have nowadays. Um, you know, my dad did sneak a lot of um, things in that he shouldn't have, and you know, I saw him suffer, right? And um, it, it, it's something that I wanted to do, be connected with something like this when I got back to New Zealand. Uh, but now it's all about education, so about educating not just my employees, but also our customers. Um, you know, the, the people that sell our food in this hotel, like my catering managers, my servers, it, it's ever evolving, right? And, and, you know, having an organization like this, you, you, you learn about so much more and um, whatever information that can come down to our level, um, the, the different researches, uh, the different um, information that we can have on, on a daily basis, you know, I, I know you, the people in this room might have pushed for this legislation of um, the council taking the gluten-free icons off of the menus. Um, that's big, right? And to be honest, I had no clue that this was a requirement until they came here and did a verification. So how, how should that information should have come to me? I don't know, right? Well, was it something that the MPI then instructed the council to do, that the council should have sent out a, a really good information. So now I have to redo all my menus, which is not a bad thing, but you know, I was taking that icon off and, and having a verbiage. I still noticed that there's a lot of restaurants. When we did the research of well, what, what are people saying on the menus, and there's a lot of top restaurants here, especially ones across the, the waterway here, and then in Auckland, that don't have any verbiage at all on the menu. Um, so it was important for us, the verbiage that we put on the, the, the bottom of our menu, um, really ask that question, really ask, you know, what, what, what should, um, or what do they be asking? Um, I, I know all of us, or some of us in this room may, may have difficulty going out to eat, but the way that we do it here would be, if somebody says they are celiac, 99% um, of the time, my chef would actually go out and speak to the customer. <coughs> so, you know, there's obviously different theories of, of what they can have and they can't have. Um, unfortunately, there are some people that it's more of a lifestyle, uh, for them, and they don't want to eat gluten, but sort of sometimes you're in for everybody else. So it's really trying to find the education. So we have the opportunity. I'm very lucky that we have open kitchens here. Mm -hmm. So the, that connectivity with, with the customer is very, very easy for us. But at the same time, we're, we're making sure that we're already walking through. We talk about the process. We talk about what foods they should steer away from. Um, but but you know, they're having that, um, having that assurance that we, we, we are caring of what goes on their plate is the biggest thing for, for me um, that I do on a daily basis. So I don't know how much you want me to talk, you can keep on going and going and going, right? But um, you know, I know there's a few questions. And... Well, we have got a few questions. Um, but just when you were talking about that changes to the menu, I remember um, seeing something on the celiac disease page, which is not which is kind of like a forum for people with celiac disease, it's yep. not our thing. And they were talking about cafes that have changed to GF to gluten friendly. Yes. And which is just confuses everybody. What does that mean? Is it a gluten free ingredient that they're not taking care around cross contamination? So um, it's confusing a lot of people, the, the GF. Yeah, so what, what I understand, so I got my verification probably about three weeks ago. So very um, nice gentleman that came and does the whole inspection of kitchens. So it checks under the, the stoves, the fridges, the temperatures, you name it. Um, but obviously a big component for him was the menu, right? And this was a, a big um, sort of topic for them. So we're not allowed to have any icons. What I believe is what the GF, the gluten friendly or gluten free, that has to go away. Um, and then it's up to you how you want to sort of put on the menu. Um, you know, our, our food does contain gluten, nuts, Please ask your server. Um, we'll be more than happy to to assist you with the menu item. So, um, I, I think that's where 
uh, what I understand is from the from the council point of view is that we have to remove that completely. We've got some questions here, Brent, so yeah. I'll fire them at you. What should a customer ask in a cafe or restaurant when trying to order celiac safe food so it can be clearly communicated to the chefs that require celiac safe food to free meal? Yeah, well, I think they just sort of mention it. I personally, if somebody was really concerned um, of coming out, you know, we, we, we had a, a couple that came in for afternoon tea where we did a celiac weekend. If you don't know this room, probably 85% of my afternoon tea is actually good food. Um, so we, we're very fortunate that you know, 50% I can change to have an amazing experience. Um, ask to see the chef. Ask to, ask to see somebody who knows what they're talking about. You know, some, some of these servers, this is not their full time job, this is like a part time job for them. Um, sometimes if they make things up along the way, I'm not going to lie to you, but I personally would say speak to the chef. He's the one that's working the pants, I know it could be busy, um, but you know, just having that reassurance and you know, talk, touching some of those tables when we had gluten free week and I touched um, the people that specified that they were celiac. And they didn't say it was just so nice to see the chef out there reassuring that this was. This is what's going in their food, and so anything that you can do to actually try and speak to somebody. Be your own advocate. Yeah, be your own advocate. Yeah, I, I think it's very interesting. Um, you mentioned before about some mayonnaise that has yeah. and stuff. Uh, are there hospitality products frequently used in the industry that may hide gluten that somebody with celiac disease may think about? Yeah, I think I touched on a few. You know, the things that come to me um, are some cheeses. I think, you know, when, when we think cheese, um, you know, a majority of them are gluten free, but there's definitely some of the seed starch stabilizers that they put in these cheeses that you wouldn't know about at all. Um, you know, there, there, there was talk of, you know, when, when I was doing some research in the years ago about blue cheese and the different mold that they use, right? So obviously that mold is grown on bread and everything else. Is that mold safe? Um, you know, I, I believe blue cheese is pretty much off the list now, but definitely some of those process cheddars and so forth definitely have those um, starch stabilizers in there and baked beans right i, I didn't need baked beans mm -hmm. i you know if, if somebody came in and said can i have a gluten-free breakfast you know i know my sausages don't have um you know any sort of fillers in there from the bread because we you know who makes our sausages but i would put baked beans right if there be certain brands out there that um that are gluten free, but it's all about you know reading the labels. And mm -hmm. you know, I, living in the United States, the, the whole um, the USDA and then what they have to put on you know, the, the requirements uh, are so complicated that they never they, they, they go by numbers and they never really tell you what goes on these products. And I think you know this is a, a big part of not knowing really what goes into the, these processed foods. And I always tell people shop around the, 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 the supermarket around the outside and shop on the inside. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we love them And um, do you have any tips for using alternative gluten free flour options for home cooks? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, to, be, to be honest, you know, there's amazing some little rice flours out there that's not more baking. You know, we, we, we do um, fried chicken, we have fried chicken on the menu downstairs. I use our Machiko. Um, we do a Chico chicken, which is sort of like a, a, there is a rice flour, but it's sort of like a sweetened rice flour. Um, but that's the, how I cook my fried chicken. So, you know, you, you get these amazing flours that you can do just as, as fantastic um, sort of dredges for the chicken. You want to try chicken, but over not need it. But, you know, we even did one um, that we used a little bit of potato starch in there, and we used um, cornflakes. So there's, again, you gotta know what, what cornflakes have the gluten in. There's some that are more those natural cornflakes. So we blended up the cornflakes to be like a dust and we, we coated that with a different flour and we made fried chicken. So, you know, they're, they're, you can still enjoy, um, you know, the, the joys of life about having these different um, flours. You know, those, those Asian markets have amazing, um, you know, those sort of different rice flours and so forth. Right. Um... Are there any types of recipes or ingredients you tend to steer clear of when cooking gluten free? Mm, I think um, definitely processed cheeses, and I think I've talked about that. Uh, 
And I'm a soy sauce, right? Um, soy sauce is a big one. Uh, a lot of Asian sauces. Um, poison, oyster, like the things that, you know, you, you love and you add it to your stir fries and everything else. So we really spin team clear to stay out there. We, we use a lot more probably tamari than, than soy sauce in this hotel. Um, we have very, very minimal soy sauce, but it's all um, tamari. Okay? So you know those Asian sauces, I think, um, are the ones that probably steer clear of. What's your thought about cafes and restaurants charging surcharges for gluten-free food? It's ridiculous. It's absurd. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, why? You know, it, it's, you know, like fried chicken, I'm changing one ingredient to still making an unbelievable fried chicken. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the better fried chickens out there. Machiko, you know, if you look at Hawaii, Machiko fried chicken is, is sort of like the next Louisiana hot chicken. Like, the, you can make amazing fried chicken with, with, with different ingredients that don't cost any more. Um, you, you're not doing yourself any disservice or to change your ingredients. It's, it's just about mind what goes in your food. It is, there's a number of people, a number of cooks, a number of servers, you, they'll ask you, where does your meat come from? And they'll say, a bit food truck, right? Um, you know, we're, we're, what we do here is, is at the hotel, we actually go to the farm. We've taken my front of the house, the back of the house. We've gone down to Cleveland to go see the buffalo um, to make the cheese. And we've, um, you know, my, my chefs and myself have gone down to farms down in Kaikoura and, and spent three days to understand that the, the, the raising of the cattle and what they eat and, and how they sort of free form they, to be honest, they live right on the coastline of Kaikoura is probably the best life that these guys have ever had. But at the same time, you know, we went down to um, Stewart Island and spent a day down there to understand the farming process of um, uh, big glory based salmon and what feed they're feeding and what goes into that feed and uh, how, do, how often they feed them. And um, it's just it's a, it, it, we, we in New Zealand are very, very lucky that separation between a chef and a producer is in, in our own backyard. And it, it, you've got to spend the time to, to go to these plants, go to the understanding. They, 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 these people are wealth of knowledge, the farmers, and they, they, they will tell you, um, you know, what's good, what's bad, what's, what troubles them or keeps them awake here every night of, of the business. But we are very, very lucky here that everything's within, you know, a, a drive. And if, as a chef, you will want to know what goes in the product. What, you know, and I can tell the story, the chefs were storytellers, right? Like here being, uh, I'm like a conductor with my hands and everything else, but it's, it's, it's a wealth of knowledge. And um, as I said, in New Zealand, um, if we're not doing the research because it is in our backyard, it, 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 you're not a chef. Okay. So um, what message would you like to give to the New Zealand hospitality industry? Um, <laughs> it's all awareness. I think it's like well, there's two two points to this this question. I think um, I think pushing awareness, training, development um, is is a, is a big thing. I think we have every opportunity to um, take on new information. Um, how does it get to us? Is, is the biggest tool, right? I think whatever it can be done by the hospitality industry. I, I understand it's on us as well to go do our research, but if there's a, 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 a sort of a sector of the hospitality that comes to training, we, we, we have very robust training here at Hyatt. Every year we, we, we need to do um, a different allergen awareness training. It's front of the house and the back of the house. So it's mandated every, every year for us, and it's, and it's updated uh, mainly from the USDA, but it's, it's, it's high based in something that if we don't do the, the requirement, um, we'll be able to pass out sort of learning process and later. And that's everything from our stewards all the way through to our waitresses and our chefs and everything else. So that, that's a, a tool for that we have to and hire what, what could be in, in the hospitality sector that's giving us that, that more information would be amazing. Yeah, so we, we have a um, gluten-free catering guide, training, yeah. that, through our dining out program. Um, and it's, it's just getting people to understand the importance of it, I suppose. Sure. So do you think it's a it's an asset for a staff member who's working in hospitality to have that accreditation, that you've done that gluten-free catering I, I think that, I don't know if you need to have everybody go, but the people that are in charge, right? The people that 
uh, cooking it and um, understanding it. You know, I I large of it here. Um, you know, not large. It's large-ish, but you know, two hundred. Uh, the other properties globally, I was doing you know, three, four thousand people at a time. And, just to mention the list that I used to get for, for allergens, things that I've never heard of in my life. But, you know, it's the way that we had to design our menus now, especially for the, the larger groups. Um, you've got to think about everything. And, and you know, we're, we're at a point now that it's, it's very simplistic. We don't do a lot of sources here because you know, different thickening agents you may have to use for a sauce. Um, it's really talking, it's, we'll talk about the, the food in its natural state really showcasing that rather than a lot of different heavy sauces or marinations um, because garlic you know low sodium you, you name it i have them right and, and so we, we really um are mindful of when we design a menu especially for the event space um that that's really important that we we think about everybody's um sort of preferences um, and obviously um people's dietary requirements so yeah i think for, for myself it, I think it'd be better if it's a couple of leaders. You know, we, 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 we would do an event up here. We all talk at the beginning of the event, we, talk, we go through the menu. So, you know, I could have 25 servers that are here. We talk about each item, um, what it has contains in there. Um, when we do take the order, we, we actually make sure we take an order if we have a sit down dinner, um, that we uh, are talking about, you know, do you have any allergies? We write them down, comes back before we play up. We have a big whiteboard. And we talk about the different um, allergens that people may have um, on the whiteboard for each individual person. Not everybody does it. Um, you know, we're, we're a very discerning customer that we want to make sure that we're taken care of. Um, I hope that the industry, the rest of the industry, really looks at what they can do in their own, uh, own place of, of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got a question um, here. So, um, given that you've worked and lived internationally, yep. Um, are there any countries or types of cuisine that are safer for celiac travelers? Um, that's a really good question. You know, I, I think when you really think about it, you know, the whole Mediterranean is just very, to me, it's very natural, it's very fresh, it's very clean, I'm eating. So anywhere there are um, more like Mediterranean type of cuisine, um, I think it's probably the best bet to, to, to stick with. I'm just going to make a comment. So Dana and I were at an event, um, just to illustrate one of the points you're making. Dana and I were out at an event a couple of weeks ago and they gave a chef came up afterwards and said he'd just finished his training and he had absolutely nothing that taught him about allergens or avoiding allergens and so on during his training. Yeah. And um, he was he was coming forward and he wanted to learn and he, he was really active, wasn't he? He was really keen. But nothing up to that point. Yeah, so so I just thought on my first printers. So um you know, my, my goal is to have a multiple different printers come through on, on a yearly basis. And um, you know but they, they have a whole series of you know over two years of package and um you know I, I I looked at the, the program of uh, the allergens or food safety, and it just touches on, on, on more of the basic thing. It doesn't dive into the, the, the depth of what you would like it to be. So, as I said, I'm part of this panel that really want to change this criteria, especially on this whole apprentice um, focus. You know, I think schooling, I don't really know, again, I've never been in New Zealand for a number of years. I don't know what they're doing at the, the cooking schools and how much they dive into it, but just looking at the program of the apprenticeship at the hotel, um, definitely a lot more in-depth um, training. And obviously that's what we're here for as well, to, to really talk them through this. Um, but yeah, for, for, for a younger chef to come up and say that, it's obviously a bit of a support thing and, and, and not having that knowledge. What's the family involved with you? Who's a main couple? Um, and, uh, chefs, tutors, um, uh, people that do the assessments before, for, for this, so this is the first of its kind that just started up. Um, so let's see what what what, what goes down. Yeah. You might do unbreakable, um, so just speak about uh, your involvement uh, with young chefs and the ESCA competition. Yeah. And uh, where these members are on an international perspective as well, and uh, how they can also showcase some of this of 
the understanding of dietary requirements? Yeah, so um, I was very fortunate to have a very young, young chef who's now departed because he got snapped up pretty fast. <laughs> and, I knew he was getting snapped up. He's now gone to Sydney and working for a three star Michelin chef. But we had a gentleman, Sam, out of the Hawks Bay, um, you know, came through a bakery family out of the Hawks Bay um, and, and was just full of flour and everything. And, uh, <laughs> and he was a, a guy that really was mindful of what, what goes into his food. And, and again, the research of Know, what what's being put on the plates and he you know he, I sent him to to learn butchery like to go break down an animal and to make cured meats and his kid was just unreal but you know we we, we, we came across this Nestle um, competition that, that that came down the pipeline and you had to use um, certain Nestle products and we, we, we looked at everything of what we could do and you know how we could alter the Nestle products um, to obviously be very food safe. Um, but obviously an amazing flavor profile and um, you know, we came out with a couple of different dishes which was out of this world and very, very different. But, you know, it, it, there is, as a creativity, as a chef, that there's great products there that it is a great base, but then you can create something from it. And um, you know, I was very fortunate that Sam won the competition. Mm -hmm. um, so the competition was Australia, New Zealand based in um, sort of the COVID period. And, um, it was all online and everything else, and I'm proud to say that that's the same one. But yeah, no, the, 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 you know, the more and more awareness that are coming out from these bigger, bigger companies, vehicles, um, obviously, um, Nestle, um, it, it's sort of a tool in the kitchen that we, we, we can really look at and then utilize throughout that, that space. Mm. You're up to is that an ongoing thing? Yeah, so after the tea, a little bit different. So, Probably a good plug, I can talk about that. <laughs> um, yeah, Michelle, they're not your typical three tier stand. Here's all your food, and he's like staring at, oh, where do I start? And kind of look over the, the stand to, to talk to your friends and family and everything else. I, I course it out. So um, it's over five courses, and um, it's a little bit whimsical, a little bit playful, but I pair sweet and savory. So, you know, you have a couple of savory bites, and we were actually today when we had lunch, um, we prepared some of those savory bites for you. So. They call them snacks. So we have some different snacks that are on my afternoon tea, and um, they're the, the savory kind um, that, that we utilize in the afternoon tea. So, yes, it's an ongoing Wednesday through um, Sunday. Um, same price point on a Wednesday than on Sunday, um, but obviously, there's champagne if you want to you know, enjoy yourself um, throughout the day. And uh, no, it's, it's, it's something that um, I wanted to do. It's very big here in, in New Zealand. It's, it's a lot bigger than I thought it was. Um, so I said, well, okay, how can we change the the, the perception, the, the thought process, and, and what goes into it? You know, um, when we thought, when we think about afternoon tea, it's about those club sandwiches. It's about the the lamingtons. It's about the scones. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about so much more different and, you know, we, we make our own crackers in house, so the gluten free, we make them from seeds and um, different nuts and so forth. So we make our own crackers um, in house. So again, we have the ability in this hotel to do a lot of things in house that maybe a lot of establishments may not have the resources to do. But, you know, there's a couple of great products that I, I wish I would their names but my wife um put some different clues every crackers that have the cheese at home um there's more and more coming out on a daily basis a little bit sweeter my my my, my liking than some of these you know, more processed crackers at the supermarket but um yeah we, we make our own um desserts my pastry chef is phenomenal he's one of the best pastry chefs in New Zealand right now um he he sort of takes you through a journey as well and he's really focused on the, the, the non gluten free um, desserts. And so, even so, like last night, we, we had desserts that, you know, was um, gluten free, um, but it was just amazing. I hope people enjoyed it. And it's something to do with desserts. I can't wait to. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 They don't even know. No. They're not going to be doing They say, actually, this is what I want to do. Thank you for all your input into the act. I really appreciate it. No, I, I can't wait to be the heat. <laughs> Good. Is there any other questions? No, just very hungry now. Yeah. <laughs> I've got um, one for Matt. Yep. That's okay. So just following up on 
the um, serology. So if you've had a, if, um, a child's had a positive gene test, but bloods have been negative so far, but there's quite high prevalence in the family, um, how often should they be getting serology done um, in that case? So gene testing just is an at-risk test in terms of 50, 60% of the community will be gene positive. Yeah, so that, yeah. Um, so it doesn't help in terms of diagnosis. If they're serology negative, that's great. It suggests they don't have celiac disease at the moment. And as before, uh, the, the, if they have symptoms, they should certainly be tested again. And depending on the age of the child at the time, then thinking about a time to retest it routinely. But I wouldn't keep testing beyond 12 unless they've been having symptoms. Any other questions? No, that's all there. Um, we've got a couple of questions that were for Senate New Zealand. So given the changing shopping habits, Will CNZ look to have endorsements similar to the Dining Out program for online retailers rather than only the cross grain logo accreditation, which for small businesses would be a costly exercise? So it's, it's a good idea, but um, the resources that would be required to develop a new accreditation um, process, program, I don't know how we resource that. So, or whether there's something already existing somewhere else that we could adapt for New Zealand. So, that's in response to that. Um, as a member, how do we feed our concerns or issues that CNZ can advocate on our behalf? So, you can always email us to admin at celiac.org.nz, and if it's a medical question, we'll refer to the medical advisory panel. Um, if it's an advocacy issue, we really would like um, people to be their own advocate and feel empowered to do that. Um, so if there's something at school, um, we've developed, Lisa Jury's developed a Living Celiac Safe Closing Free Toolkit. So that's on our website and you can get some tips on how to be your own advocate at early childhood education in schools, um, around camps and things like that. If there's concerns about products, and you think that they're not labelled correctly, you need to go to MPI because they are the organisation that addresses that. So if you lodge a complaint, um, you can see the information on their website on how to do that. So hopefully that responds to that question. The key thing with that too is if you can, keep the packaging yeah. and, and just sample the product if you can. Yeah. You can contact them because it can be batch dependent, which makes it much easier for them if you who you think there's been an oxy or you've been gluten, you yeah, keep the packaging, even if even if it's empty at the time, it'll help them in your investigation. They're good really, advice. really good at following it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. Um, it's not uncommon for there to be discussions around becoming a member and what the value is. Do you see an opportunity to regularly post this info on the Facebook page and other platforms? I suppose as a not-for-profit organisation or a for-purpose organisation, the main benefit you receive as being a member of CDAC New Zealand is that you are supporting an organisation that supports people with CDAC disease. So by supporting us, we're able to support you. So that's the main benefit and how you communicate that is always difficult. People often want to see something tangible like the magazine, which is really important information sharing and a good way for us for sharing um, our, our sponsors' products and sharing um, latest research and advice. But the main benefit an, an individual gets by being a member of CDAC New Zealand is that CDAC New Zealand exists. And um, we have the website and Facebook page. And I suppose communicating that is that you're supporting us to support you. I don't know how else to kind of say that. So, um, yeah, I think if you have celiac disease, the best thing you can do to increase our influence and our ability to advocate on your behalf is to become a member. And by doing that, then we can support you better. Well, I don't think you can underestimate the, um, <coughs> the assistance that celiac New Zealand gives to newly diagnosed um, celiacs because it, it's um, it's life changing for people and, and, and often people are 
um, overwhelmed by what they had to think about. And I know for me and also for people that I've recommended join the society, um, the help that they've, they've received and just in the reading material and, and the other, um, you know, the accessibility to uh, information, it, it's enormously helpful. And, um, and I don't think we should like this. No. And maybe we need stories like that shared more with our other members and the people considering being a member. So maybe if we have members that seem to benefit and can tell us a story about it, that's another way we can um, tell people about the benefit of being a member. Which we do in our magazine, which is great. We have a feature. Yeah. Maybe we could do little ones on Facebook. Yeah. And it's also really important if people have the capacity to um, be a volunteer for CBA New Zealand and help support other people with CBA in their communities, that they contact us and we can support them to um, have information and resources to get more awareness in their communities about CBA disease and help more people that work in hospitality know about it and more um, GPs access the information that our medical advisory panel has. And also the conference is, a, is going to be fantastic. It's a great, great way to get face to face and network with other people that see that disease. It's actually a question I have actually for the medical people actually is, I've often heard people say that if you're a disease and you have blood tests, when you have blood tests, they're often the if you're down to like you know the, the lowest level of what a reading is that if you're a celiac that that's actually not good um it's more critical if you're a celiac that your your reading is better than that it's probably not explaining it very well let's say you've got a range let's say you have an eye test and you've got a range of I don't know, 100 to 200 and you're at 100 if you're a celiac that's actually worse than if it's a normal person that got a reading of 100. Is there any truth in this? I often hear people bandying this stuff around that if you're at a really low level, but you're still within the range of a blood test, that if you're a celiac, that's a lot worse than it should be. He's saying that if you see that disease, you have to be healthier than people without seeing No, it's a blood test reading. If you have a whole different blood tests and the results come back that you're in the low level of an acceptable range, that if you're a celiac, it's, it's, it's still not good. good. Even yeah. though you're in the acceptable range, it's still not good if it's low. Your eye is Well, any, 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 blood blood test. Blood test. any blood test. Okay. Yeah. That if you're in the low, you're in the, you're no, in the, the range, range, you're in the end of the range. Shit. But you can just call the. Uh, Still within normal. The negative range. range. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, talk, but talking more about iron and other, yeah, other markers, other markers. Yeah. Whether um, your stores should be actually at the higher end, higher higher end rather than the lower end. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, I just often hear people talking about this, and I, I don't get into a conversation because I wouldn't have clue. Uh, but I, I think I'll be able to send a patient who's uh, registered as zero uh, level antibody level. Um, I mean, I generally accept if the level ones to say if you're treated with 10 as anybody who's less than 15 and not treated with that, that would be fine. But if there's probably some loose correlation at the higher level that is that uh, and would correlate with your degree of um, bonus damage to your know, system. And as your antibody level drops, maybe it goes for light and stuff and feel like it's a very loose correlation. Mm -hmm. There definitely have been studies that show down the line if the antibody test is in the negative range, by chance if you had a small biopsy at the time, but uh, you can get uh, subtle loose changes and you could be asymptomatic. Um, what we what you can do about that when the long term is difficult. We would struggle to kind of do that in children because that would require another general surgery to get um, smaller wipes in to be done. Um, so I think that probably is a kind of grey zone, but the reality is, I mean, from my point of view, if your level is uh, in the normal range, then you would accept that. Unless, of course, you've got sort of symptoms and stuff like that. 
bigger civic health opportunities. I suppose in terms of more kind of general nutritional markers, mm -hmm. every um, every kind of marker there is has a range of normality. Mm -hmm. Often they follow almost like a, a bell curve, so that um, the absolute kind of average, uh, almost kind of fifty percent of people by definition will be slightly below that, fifty percent will be slightly above that. And I don't think that there is any good evidence to say that if you're sort of mm -hmm. low than the absolute mean, the absolute fifty percent that you need to get too worried about it with it if you're within the normal range mm -hmm. by definition. And I think that that's where it sits. People the people end up having these discussions and they yeah. end up convincing themselves yeah. and you know yeah, this is because I'm seeing it. Yeah, and, then, and I think if you are in the low normal range for something, it maybe means that you should be a little bit more aware of making sure that your diet is well supplemented with that. But I certainly wouldn't go out of my way to if you like artificially supplement no. the diet with like, tonics and medicines yeah. and what have yeah. you if you're within the normal range. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions for the group? Do you still have anybody online? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's, there's still participants, but there's no yeah, like, questions. Okay. Oh, I'll put a question that's commonly sort of asked. So, the person who develops celiac disease, say, later on in life, is there a direct correlation with developing, say, um, a dairy intolerance and stuff like that? It's a common question that mm -hmm. gets asked. Often after a diagnosis of celiac disease, and they've been damaged to the line, there are um, an inability to produce as much lactase as we need to metabolize that toe. That toe system of sugar, and that needs to be broken down to be properly absorbed. And we have an enzyme that we call lactase that does that job. And so often following the celiac disease, we're not producing lactase as well. And then the lactose and milk sugar ends up getting fermented and giving us symptoms of sore tummies and bloating and flatulence and um, diarrhea, etc. One of the things that I manage constantly is, is the tendency to assume that all dairy is bad. And before I know it, someone's reading packets from may contain traces of dairy. When actually, is it, in terms of lactose and foods, this is a bit of a um, um, a scale and liquid milk and anything made with raw liquid milk, custom ice cream is the most lactose. Yogurt's a little bit less, Greek yogurt a little bit less again because when we make Greek yogurt, we strain it and when we get rid of the whey, we lose some of the lactose. And then we're down to our cottage or clot, our Greek camembert. By the time we get to a cheddar cheese, the lactose is actually very, very low in it. Parmesan Romano butter has virtually none. So we, and, and typically, even in a secondary lactose intolerance, milk used to make a batch of muffin is actually by the by. And um, in fact, most people with a secondary lactose intolerance will tolerate about 50 grams of lactose a day. And that's the equivalent of a splash of milk and about three glasses of tea. So there's absolutely no need to go on a dairy-free diet. And it's one of the things that's absolutely not my head in. That most gluten or many gluten free products are also dairy free. Mm -hmm. And the other big thing to consider is that with gut healing, you get improved tolerance of lactose. So I would, I would typically say, look, you have six months using lactose free milk, not having ice cream, continue to eat all your lower lactose products, and then give them another go. One or two things will happen if you still have a bit of an issue, then just give it a wee bit more time and try again. But this, absolutely no need to be on a gluten-free diet and in fact using things like soy as an alternative as a rabbit hole because many soy milks have um, gluten in them and any of your other plant-based milks don't have enough protein fat and calcium so particularly in children that's a big nutritional hole to try and make up if we're using rice milk or almond milk or one of the other alternative milks so as much as possible, just do no lactose for a wee while and then give it another go. Mm -hmm. Good question. Mm -hmm. I just have one question as well, sorry. So with the vaccine rollout, the COVID vaccine, so celiac's included in group three because of the influenza criteria. Um, is there anything that 
celiac should be doing to be able to be getting those access codes and things to sign up to their vaccine? Like, should they get in touch with their GP to make sure that they're in the screening list for that or anything like that? Do you know what? Yeah, I think that's a question for Kristen as a GP. Could you put her in the mm -hmm. and step up? Yeah. I know that in South Auckland, pretty much if you contact a GP, if you have concerns, you can be directed to a <coughs> vaccine centre. Yeah, you just turn up to the vaccine centre. Well, it's, it's just they have to have the, it, the right number of doses where you put yeah. the people in mm -hmm. So it's better to contact so you. Three, want, you yeah. Just go back, yeah. You have to get a form to come out and then not contact you. Yeah. Because the they want people to get the vaccine, but they're doing a managed rollout so yeah. that they yes. can manage the, the vaccine availability. But I, I would suggest they contact their GP. Mm -hmm. yeah. That would be the, the first point. Mm -hmm. Or even that outline number that's the COVID 19 outline number. Mm -hmm. Although I'd say it'd be pretty inundated. So maybe not. Um, so, if there's no more questions, yeah. I'll hand back to you, Dawn. I think that's, uh, that's it. Thank you all so much for attending. Thank you to those of you who have attended virtually. Mm -hmm. I need to apologise now because we're going to some of the groups like food and you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, thanks everybody, and hopefully, we will see you all at the conference in November. So yeah, so we'll have that information going on the website. Um, Soon, soon, yeah, soon, yeah. But you'll definitely be able to book early bird, early bird prices from the 15th of July. That's our goal, yeah. And we will be discounting member prices to 50%. Lovely. All right. Yeah. See you later, guys. Thanks so much. Bye. 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 Bye.